This video is to help with the calculations for Part B of the Gas Concepts Lab. Before you do these calculations, please watch the video on how the data was collected. So for Part B of the Gas Concepts Lab, we are using what is called the Dumas Method to figure out the molar mass of an unknown volatile liquid. So what the Dumas Method does is it uses the ideal gas law to calculate the molar mass. In order to use the Dumas method, we need the unknown to be a volatile liquid. When I use the term volatile, I'm talking about a liquid with a very low boiling point, much lower than that of water. So a refresher on what the ideal gas law is. There's an equation sheet also in the folder for this lab that has all the equations that you will need for this lab on it. One of those equations is the ideal gas law. And that is PV is equal to NRT. The pressure, P, is measured in ATM. The volume, V, is measured in liters. This N value is actually the number of moles. The R is called the gas constant constant, and this is going to be the same every time you use this equation, and the gas constant that we are using is 0 0.08206. The reason we're using this gas constant is because it has the units of all the other variables in it. Liters for volume, ATM for the pressure, moles for the number of moles, and then Kelvin for temperature. The last variable in the equation, the T, stands for temperature, and that needs to be measured in Kelvin. Now the trick when we're using this specific equation in lab is usually when we measure temperature in lab, we're measuring it in degrees Celsius. So it will need to be converted to Kelvin. So in order to do that, we're going to be taking the temperature in degrees Celsius and adding 273.15 to that and it's the Kelvin amount that we'll plug in to this equation. So how are we using this equation to solve for the molar mass? Because in the past, when we have done molar mass calculations, we have usually done them using the periodic table. We take our periodic table and using the chemical formula, we look up the masses of each element present in the chemical formula and then calculate. When we've calculated it though, we've always used grams per mole for the units on molar mass. So instead of using the periodic table to calculate the molar mass, we are going to use the ideal gas law because of these units. So if we want the molar mass of an unknown using the ideal gas law, as long as we know the grams of the substance under question, and the amount of moles of the substance under question, we can figure out what its molar mass should be. So the grams we can get during the lab by taking masses on the scale. The amount of moles we can get using this ideal gas law. So to get the moles, we would rearrange this equation to solve for the n variable, which represents the number of moles. The other variables, pressure, volume and temperature we can get during class. The pressure will be the pressure in the room that we'll get from a barometer in class. The volume we can measure with a graduated cylinder. The R value is constant and already given to us. And then the temperature is going to be the temperature of the hot water bath that was used in that experiment. If you've watched the video already on the data collection, you probably already have the pressure, volume, and temperature recorded. I'm going to go through with the values that were given to you in the data collection video and show you how we're going to use them uh, to come up with the molar mass. So in the video, they gave you the mass of, they didn't use a test tube, in this case they used an Erlenmeyer flask. So they gave you the mass of the Erlenmeyer flask with the foil and the copper. And that mass was 90.4576 grams. They then added 5 mils of the unknown liquid that we're trying to figure out the molar mass of. 
<clears throat> then they did the experiment. So this second mass, this is the mass after the experiment was completed, once the unknown liquid was recondensed. So in the experiment, in the video, they took this Erlenmeyer flask with a tiny pinhole in it, heated it up until all of the liquid turned into a gas. Once all of the liquid turned into a gas, they recondensed it, cooled it down so that that gas turned back into liquid form. So this second number here, this is the Erlenmeyer flask with the foil and now the condensed liquid. So the reason that they did this was because that condensed liquid is going to equal to, so the condensed liquid is going to equal to the volume that the gas took up. Because when a liquid turns into a gas, gases take the shape and space of the container that they're in. So those gas particles, if we have a liquid, once we change it into a gas, now that gas is spread out throughout the entire container. So if we recondense it back down, that condensed liquid, which is going to be a smaller amount than our original, will equal the amount of gas. So when it asks for the mass of the condensed liquid, to calculate that, remember we want to do to the words what we do to the numbers. So if I subtract these two numbers, I will be taking out the mass of the test tube and the mass of the foil, and I'll be left with just the condensed liquid. So subtracting those, keeping with your significant figures, and making sure to put your units. Now, for the volume of the Erlenmeyer flask, because remember it was an Erlenmeyer flask in the video, not a test tube. This value was given on the video as well. I forgot to write it down, so let me look it up quick. And it was 154 milliliters. So the way that they figured out the volume of the Erlenmeyer flask is by filling that Erlenmeyer flask with water and then pouring that water into a graduated cylinder, because graduated cylinders are what we use to figure out volume. So the reason for this, figuring out the volume of the Erlenmeyer flask, is because when a liquid turns into a gas, it spreads out and it takes the whole space of the container it's in. So if we know the volume of the Erlenmeyer flask, we know the volume of the gas that was in the flask. So the volume of the gas in the flask is 154 milliliters. While we were heating that initial unknown, trying to get it in a vaporized state, in a gaseous form, the temperature of the water was taken, and that temperature was 100.5 degrees Celsius. Now, I said we were going to be using the ideal gas law, to figure out the number of moles. That's the goal. Well, with the ideal gas law, note that temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So that's why they have this degrees Kelvin mark. So to figure out the degrees Kelvin, make sure you are taking that value, the 100.05, and adding 273.15 to it. Next, we have the room pressure. Now, this is something the instructor would give you based off of the pressure in the room at the time of the experiment, and that was given as 746.5 torr. In the video, it said millimeters of mercury, but one millimeter of mercury is equal to one torr, so it's the same value. Notice once again, looking at the ideal gas law that we're using, we want our pressure in ATM. So you need to convert TOR to ATM. And in order to do that, you're going to be using a conversion factor where 760 TOR is equal to one ATM. 
So use dimensional analysis, set this up so you're canceling out the tour, and your answer is left with ATM. Once again, using sig figs, since you're going to be dividing here, you have four sig figs in your initial amount, so you want four sig figs in your answer. Let me move back up to the volume for a second, because <clears throat> while we're going through and using the ideal gas law and checking that all our units are in the units we want them in, I noticed that volume we want in liters. But what is the volume given in? It's given in milliliters. So you are going to need to convert this value as well to liters. In order to do that, you can use the conversion factor where 1,000 milliliters is equal to one liter. Using dimensional analysis, once again, taking 154 divided by 1,000 would give you your liters. Once you have all of your variables in the correct units, we can move on to calculating the moles of the unknown gas. So to calculate the moles of the unknown gas, we're using the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT. And what we need to do is we're solving for moles, so we want to rearrange the equation to solve for N. So in order to do that, we need to get rid of the R and the T. We need them on the other side of the equal sign. And to do that, we want to do the opposite operation that's being applied. So what I mean by that is right now, we're taking the moles times the gas constant times temperature. So we're multiplying. So to get rid of R and T, we're going to do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. So if I divide this side by RT, it's going to cancel out the R variable, and it's also going to cancel out the temperature variable, leaving N by itself. But notice, whatever we do to one side of the equation, we have to do to the other side of the equation. So since I divided by RT over here, I need to also divide by RT on the other side. This transforms my equation to solve for moles into P, V over R, T. The moles we're solving for are moles of our gas. And we can do this because the pressure of the gas is the same as the pressure in the room. The volume of the gas is the same as the volume of that Erlenmeyer flask that we filled with water. The R value is a constant, and then the temperature, that's the temperature of the boiling water when the unknown liquid was in a gaseous state. So all of these variables apply to the gas, which is why they can be used to calculate moles of the gas. So all you would need to do at this point is plug in your converted values into the equation here. Once you have your number of moles, moving on down, the next question asks for the molar mass of the gas sample. And we said that molar mass, mm, is equal to the grams divided by moles. We know this because those are the units we have been using to calculate molar mass using the periodic table. It's just now we're going to calculate the molar mass using the gram amount, and the grams that we want to use is going to be the mass of the condensed liquid because that condensed liquid, that was the gas that condensed back down that filled that Erlenmeyer flask. So putting the mass of the condensed liquid on top, and then using the moles, the N value that you calculated using the ideal gas law, you can figure out what the molar mass should be in grams per mole. The last question asks what would happen to the error in the calculation if, of molar mass 
if the foil top was not completely dry when the final mass was taken. So what they're asking here is when you watched in the video and you saw them put that Erlenmeyer flask in the boiling water, if they dipped it too far down and got that foil top wet with water, what would happen if they didn't completely dry it off? So would that increase the final mass or decrease it? How would that affect your molar mass calculation? Would that appear higher or lower? So that's what they mean by be specific. There is another video to help with the part A calculations.